All righty. Good evening. Welcome to our second event in our Broadening Horizons in Preservation Heritage Cafe lecture series. Uh, this lecture is brought to you by the City of Tacoma Historic, Pre uh, Historic Preservation Office in conjunction with Historic Tacoma and the Tacoma Historical Society. I am Zoe Scuderi. I am the Historic Preservation Intern uh, for the City of Tacoma. We are joined tonight by Kathleen Booker, who is board president of uh, Historic Tacoma. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to say anything about uh, your organization? Well, thanks, Zoe. Um, Historic Tacoma is an all volunteer preservation advocacy organization. We have members and supporters and interested folks across uh, Tacoma, who are wanting to save the historic neighborhoods and places, churches, schools, and commercial places, because this is a great town with a lot of older buildings that people value. And so we try to help them um, keep that going. And very true. Um, on that, I have uh, some information from the Tacoma Historical Society about a couple of events that showcase um, those uh, things that we love about our city and uh, the history of Tacoma. Uh, one being an exhibit called Timbertown that looks at Tacoma's early history uh, and its wood product industry. Uh, and the exhibit focuses on the changes uh, that mechanization brought to forestry in the 1920s and the different related industries that developed in Tacoma as a result. The other exhibit uh, is being produced by the Sister Cities Council and will examine the 35 year history of the Tacoma Sisters Cities program. Uh, a reminder that the Tacoma Historical Society has also moved and is now located at 406 Tacoma Ave South um, and the Tacoma Historical Society would like to recognize the additional support received from Tacoma Creates for Heritage Education Programs. So with that, let's get into um, tonight's education program. Tonight's lecture is presented by Kai Kelly, Executive Director of Historic Seattle, as well as Nicholas Carr, Director of Forterra, a Washington-based uh, nonprofit land trust. So a little bit about uh, our two speakers tonight. Kai has been described as the in-house real estate expert of uh, Historic Seattle. He has worked uh, in historic preservation field for 29 years. He began his career for the pencil. Uh, he began his career working um, for the Pennsylvania Capital Preservation Committee, as well as the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources uh, in the historic uh, sites division. He managed restoration projects at 27 historical sites throughout North Carolina um, in this position. He was project manager for, project manager for the facilities management department at uh, Duke University, where he managed uh, renovation and new construction projects on, early 20th century, on the early 20th century campus. He has a BA in American Studies and Political Science from Dickinson College and two certificates from the University of Washington, uh, one in commercial real estate and the other in construction management. So uh, Kai, do you have anything that you'd like to say before we jump into our uh, conversation? I'm just happy to be here and I appreciate Kathleen, you asking, uh, asking me to participate. This is an honor to, uh, to talk to everybody. I think we'll, I think we'll all enjoy um, hearing from both of you and having a conversation about uh, the opportunities that real estate can provide for preservation. I meant to uh, say that Historic Tacoma has just wrapped up a survey of uh, the McKinley neighborhood and previously did a survey, uh, historic building inventory of the Proctor Business District. And we hope that this will lay the groundwork for um, future advocacy. Awesome, excellent. Okay, and then as well, we are um, also gonna hear from Nicholas Carr with Verterra. Um, Nicholas specializes in outreach, 
engagement, relationship building, and strategic facilitation of both conservation and community development projects um, advanced by Forterra's mission to use land for good. His experience uh, in both rural and urban communities as a political aide to um, Representative uh, Derek Kilmer has led to innovative initiatives and community building actions uh, throughout the western half of Washington state with a focus on the rural coast. Uh, Nicholas brings re those relationships um, and trust to his work on Forterra's real estate uh, transaction team by playing a key role in developing the frameworks for conservation, the community revitalization um, and development projects. Nick has worked uh, extensively with cities on Washington's coast and throughout the South Sound um, and in, in his hometown of Tacoma in pursuit of um, each community's needs and um, to build viable coalitions to successfully implement the infrastructure necessary to achieve these goals. He has also played a key role in both the development and implementation of large conservation projects for the state of Washington and its many sovereign tribal nations. So with that, Nick, do you have anything that you'd like to say before we begin? Uh, nope, just echoing uh, Kai. Uh, happy to be here. I'm excited to be taking part in something in my hometown. Um, I am a Tacoma boy. Uh, went to college here, both uh, bachelor's and master's at UW Tacoma. Um, so I have a, a strong connection uh, to the community and to this area. Uh, and, and more and more, uh, I have a connection to the buildings uh, and, and, and the historic properties uh, that, uh, that they entail uh, and what it means to, to people, what, it, what land and what buildings and what history and culture in an area means to people and how it puts them in place. So um, I'm happy to be here to have a conversation with you all. Excellent. All right. So on that, I just want to remind you guys that um, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function um, in this Zoom meeting, and we'll be taking those questions um, and answering that the, them at the end of the presentation. Uh, and if you are on Facebook, please uh, uh, ask any questions in the comments, and we will also address those. So with that, uh, Kai or Nick, whoever wants to start, take us away. I think, Kai, you've got your... Um, your presentation set. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in first, if that's okay, Nick. Absolutely, I, take it away. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, I have a board <laughs> meeting here in a little bit. So uh, um, I, you know, the, when the topic was uh, was proposed and offered to me, you know, presented to me, it's a pretty deep topic. I mean, we've got, we've got affordable housing, we've got uh, PDA world, we've got uh, TDRs, transfer development rights, we've got easements, we've got a lot of topics and I could easily spend probably way too much time on, e on each individual topic, but I put a few slides together just to uh, just to sort of give an overview of, of historic Seattle and what we've done uh, over the nearly 50 years that we've been in existence. Uh, so with that, let me share the screen here. Hope everyone can see that. So as I just mentioned, we are a public development authority. The city of Seattle formed Historic Seattle back in 1973. So we're a couple of years away from our 50th birthday. We also in 1996 formed a nonprofit, a 501c3 foundation that really uh, is the fundraising arm that helps to subsidize and underwrite a lot of the activities that the PDA uh, takes on as an organization. As the logo indicates, fundamentally in this historic preservation space, we educate and we advocate and we preserve. The images on the slide are really meant to, to uh, represent those three action items. You know, we, we, we get into places that normally you don't get into. We, and, and we provide an education opportunity and education platform to learn about other people and to learn about other people's history. And um, the center uh, photograph really does sort of represent, at least in my mind, that it does take a community to advocate for things and to really underscore that places really do matter uh, for people in the community. And then lastly, you know, we, we do swing a hammer, uh, so to speak, literally and physically, uh, literally and physically, we, uh, we do save buildings and we do preserve buildings. This is uh, Washington Hall 
when uh, we reopened the building after we preserved it and saved it, uh, there was a reopening event in 2016. So public development authorities, we have probably a three page portion of our charter. I'm probably not exaggerating that. A three page portion of our charter that's dedicated just to things that we can do, sort of the enabling type of uh, language. The first three bullet points here just really sort of codify, if you will, our role in education and advocacy and real estate. The last four uh, are just tools that we, you know, use. I wouldn't say all the time. I wouldn't say always effectively, but we uh, are provided these tools by the city to really help um, accomplish our education, advocacy, and real estate work. We are able to accept gifts. Uh, we're able to have some more official government relationship than just a uh, sort of sideline organization that's always lobbying, if you will, the city. Uh, we are able to take, take advantage of uh, advantageous financing tools that the city often uses, such as bonding. And we are able to receive property uh, from the city through a deaccessioning process. Our first project uh, that we really uh, uh, sort of got our hands involved with and, and still own was the Good Shepherd Center. And that was a property back in the mid seventies that we received with cash from the city. So there's some good tools that we utilize as a PDA to help underscore and underwrite and support our activities in, in uh, our education advocacy and real estate world. Our mission statement, we were really intentional when uh, we created this several years ago. Historic Seattle saves meaningful places to foster lively communities. You know, we really see the word saves as, a, as an action, as a verb, as an action word. Um, we are unlike a lot of organizations across the country in that we do do real estate. And I'll go into how we do it here in a second. But we see it as an action-oriented uh, passion of ours. Meaningful. You know, we don't say we save National Register properties or City of Seattle landmark properties. They're meaningful. And meaningfulness, you know, uh, is different for different people. But we want to allow that room to explore um, properties in our region that are meaningful to people and we want to try to save them. Obviously, we're a place-based organization. And we want to foster the work that we do is really more of an, an incubator or a stewardship or a, it's a fostering type of uh, activity that we do, allowing people to partake in the activity of, uh, of bringing, saving history and bringing it to life. Lively, you know, we're not a uh, house museum. We don't own house museums. Um, only on rare occasions do I dress up in like Victorian garb at the office. It, we, we are focused on um, you know, bring, saving places for people to use uh, actively. Great places to uh, live, work, and play. And communities, uh, plural. It's not a monolithic activity that we do for a singular, uh, for, for white men, right? We, we, we recognize that we uh, are, are uh, one part of a larger story that is Seattle and our role at Historic Seattle is to honor and tell that full story. So what does real estate, why is it important? Why are we here talking about this? Why am I uh, privileged to be able to talk about what Historic Seattle does in the real estate space? Obviously it's an embodiment of our mission. We are privileged and lucky to have real estate as the largest income source for us. Rent that we generate from our properties uh, pays our bills. It's also the second largest expense. And for us, it really is, I view it as the greatest either opportunity for success, which we've had a lot of, or failure. You don't watch what you're doing, you can get sideways. Another way to sort of look and, look and sort of understand how real estate plays importance to historic Seattle is just by numbers. We have eight properties. Those property, properties generate rent that's 89% of our $3 million annual operating budget. 
Uh, we have 21 staff members. Six of those staff members are caretakers at our properties. And right now we have about a $26 million balance sheet. So as you can tell from those five numbers, real estate plays a big role in what we do and how we do it. And it helps underwrite and support the other two activities with education and advocacy. It's really a, a combined effort. So I'll get into the portfolio here in a second, but the, really the main points of emphasis that I want to stress, each one of our properties is very different. We have multiple partners, funders, tenants. Uh, nearly all of them have you know, strange restrictions, unusual ownership structures. Nothing is cookie cutter, nothing is simple. I think I, that's the one thing I've learned in nearly 30 years of doing this. We also have easements. You know, There was a time when historic Seattle, I think because of the um, cheaper, if you will, uh, price for real estate, particularly in Seattle, we were able to purchase, rehab, and sell. We had sort of a revolving fund model where we take sales proceeds from one property, invest in another. Every time we do that transaction, we place an easement. So right now, Historic Seattle has about 25 easements on properties uh, throughout the region, no, mostly in Seattle. So these are the eight properties in our portfolio now. Top left is the Good Shepherd Center in Wallingford. Next to that is the Cadillac Hotel down in Pioneer Square. The Triangular Funky Building there, mid-century modern single family house called the Egan House on Lakeview Boulevard, right below St. Mark's uh, Church. Uh, middle row left is Washington Hall, project I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, the Dearborn House is our headquarters. That's to the right of Washington Hall. Bottom left is Victorian Row. It's a 14 unit affordable housing project. Middle bottom is Bellboy Apartments, which is a 16 unit and one market rate affordable housing project that I'll talk about briefly. And bottom right is Heg Phillips, another affordable housing project with 11 units of affordable housing. So just a lot of uh, information and facts here. Um, you may note that a lot of these buildings were built at the turn of the century. And there are some outliers here, obviously, even house being sort of the mid-century 1958 uh, house. And a lot of the properties that we invested in and, and picked up over time uh, were done in the early 90s, the affordable housing projects particularly. Uh, a lot of those improvements now are toward their end of their useful life, and we need to continue to reinvest in, in those specifically. But uh, those, those, those are the projects and properties in our portfolio. By size, clearly Good Shepherd Center is the largest with a pretty even distribution across, across the portfolio. We don't just obviously focus on size, but we focus on use. I will say that uh, the biggest takeaway for me through COVID was this diversification. We'd be quite honestly in a world of hurt as an organization if we relied just on performance space as an income generator. 89% of our revenue comes from rent. If we relied on say performance space, um, we wouldn't nearly be receiving as much rent as we have been throughout the pandemic. So the diversification of the portfolio has been a real asset for us during these times of trouble. Also community served, a really nice, uh, nice spread across different organizations across different communities that uh, we provide valuable historic space to. Too much information on this, but it, I put it here just to underscore the complexity that each one of our properties carries. You know, they have new market tax credits, historic tax credits, low income tax credits, serving, you know, dozens, almost 50 affordable housing uh, units, uh, all at different income levels, all different ownership structures. Um, yeah. As I said, nothing's easy. All of the deals are, are complex in their own certain way. So I'll, I'll talk about two projects. Uh, Bellboy Apartments, as I mentioned, uh, 16 units of affordable housing with one market rate unit. Uh, it's a really early example of a, a project we did in the early 90s that twinned historic and low income tax credits. I don't think there were a lot of organizations at the time that were doing that type of twinned deal. Uh, what we did was actually 
bought and saved all six of these, the reason why I put the site plan here, all six of these uh, properties, A, B, C, D, and E, and F, uh, were all in the same project bundle. And so we saved them all. We invested a lot of money to, to uh, rehab them. We, each one of them had uh, different income compliance levels, um, ownership structures. We sold buildings B, C, D, E, and F in the mid 2000s, it was like 2007, 2008. And that afforded us the ability to purchase the next project that I'll talk about Washington Hall. But Bellboy was one property that we kept of the six because the low income compliance period is, is for another, you know, I think it's still 20, 45, 20, 50. So it's, it's an extended amount of compliance that we need to retain that property. Um, but they provide, you know, 150 uh, square foot units with shared baths, uh, targeting 30% area medium income. And right now in Seattle, that's just over $22,000. The apartment building's located up on Capitol Hill, which is a phenomenal location. Uh, and each unit rents for about $600 to $625 a month. So it's been a, a great property for us. Yeah, we try, and back to my original uh, statement about embodying mission, um, affordable housing is clearly an issue in Seattle, and we really love to try to utilize our affordable uh, housing properties as a tangible way to demonstrate that you can save historic buildings and provide affordable housing. It's not either or. We don't have to tear down historic building stock in order to build monolithic shoebox buildings and jam people in 50 square foot micro units. That's not what we do. Uh, it turns my stomach when I see it. Obviously, um, this sort of work that twins both historic, you know, saving historic properties and providing affordable places for people to live uh, can be done. And we like to demonstrate that in, in the projects that we have. So as I mentioned, we sold, we sold uh, five of the six for $1.5 million. And we took that $1.5 million and we bought this building. This was back, uh, we purchased Washington Hall. This obviously is not a contemporary photo. It's from, from the 30s assessor photo. It's sort of a current photo with snow on the ground. Um, but that's Washington Hall. It's located at 14th and Fur in the Central District. It's very familiar to Kathleen. I think this was like the, the big, the big, the big project on on the plate uh, when Kathleen uh, became executive director um, uh, a few years ago, before me. Uh, but Washington Hall, as as we say and continue to say, um, you know, it's a hall for all and a hall for notables. It, you know, it was the first public performance space that hosted uh, Jimi Hendrix, first first place where he played in public. It, it uh, provided a venue for African-American artists that would come into Seattle that couldn't play other places, could always play at Washington. It's also a hall for all. I mean, it's always been since the early 1900s, a place where community could get together and celebrate um, and, and create and protest and gather. Um, it's always been like that. And it always will be, be like that because of, uh, because of historic Seattle's effort and because of our anchor partner effort uh, to save this space in this building. Purchased in 2009 for 1.5. Uh, we went through five phases of construction, $7.9 million total. Um, a really hard campaign to raise money. You know, I mean, I'll show you the capital stack here, but. It took 10 years. It took a while to put all that. I mean, it, it was not easy. It was worth it in the end, but it was not easy. Thanks to Kathleen's leadership at the time to get us over that hump and get us through that. We ran a rental program, even in the as is condition the building was in. We had squatters, we had pigeons, we had, we had no heat, we had faulty electrical system, we had unsafe life safety systems, we had of South Wall that was ready to fall into the sidewalk. And don't um, forget the big hole in the roof. A big hole, right before that we was, closed, the roof came down in the main <laughs> hall right here because of water. 
Um, yeah, so through all of that, through all the phases of construction, um, we are able to run a rental program, if nothing else, to show that the building had integrity, the mission had integrity, that there was, there, that, that, that there was a vision for the hall. We lost money in the rental program. You know, we'd, we'd offered the space for $25 an hour and it'd probably cost us $50 an hour. So on paper, it wasn't, you know, wasn't in the black, but it was something that, that was a proof of concept and showed people that it was worth investing in. We executed leases with three anchor partners um, that are well below market leases, they're triple net leases. And those leases were executed in 2016. I use the word anchor partners intentionally um, because uh, they're not just tenants. You know, I think the important, the most important thing about Washington Hall for me personally was it really did make me a better person. I don't say that very often about too many things, honestly, uh, but this project did in that it made me uh, listen. It made me shut up and listen to other people and, 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 and take into consideration other perspectives. And uh, uh, the folks that we worked with on this project were more than just tenants to us. They really were partners in providing a heart and soul to the building uh, above and beyond our effort just to save the, the bones. They really provided their life uh, to the building and, and do to this day. So we certainly had uh, some knowns and unknowns associated with the work as Kathleen alluded to. The bottom left picture, we, the, this was guys digging out the elevator pit. The elevator, we knew the elevator pit was actually below the water table. So that's actually mud that's being collected as they're digging out, they're having to dewater and deal with all the water that's coming in from the ground. There was also water coming in from above, from, from the roof leaks, creating a lot of mold throughout the building that you see, uh, see in, in second from the left photo. And so that was very apparent. And then there were obviously with that water infiltration, a lot of areas of the building that uh, were structurally unsound that were not apparent until you peeled off brick or you know, plaster, that sort of thing. There's certainly structural issues here with the post and many other areas of structure that were deficient that needed to be uh, repaired. And then there were previous owner repairs. I like to say, say this is structural duct tape, um, but it's actually duct tape that's been painted on the bottom side of the balcony here. Uh, as a repair, just to try to keep uh, some of the some of the balcony, uh, I guess, together, so to speak. Our capital stack, uh, as you can see, you know, pretty even distribution. We did receive new market tax credit uh, equity, it was two point six million dollars. Um, that was really the big uh, tranche of money that came in at just the right time. That really started to put us over the hump and get us into a, a substantial rehab phase to save the project. About a million dollars in foundation grants, public grants, another 4 million, and our 1.7 in equity. So here's just some, some photographs. I've never been to a work site where, where the construction crews look like this, by the way. It looks awfully staged to me, but it does give an give a impression of what was going on at the time. If you notice this big crack here over the exit sign, uh, that crack in the plaster happened when we actually leveled out and, and jacked up the floor here underneath the exit sign. It was it was about an inch and a half to two inches out of level. And when we jacked and sort of when the building moved and, and came to its new settle, uh, something had to give. <laughs> we we saw that the plaster was what gave. So that's all been repaired. This is a photo from behind the stage, as you see stage on the right. We had to figure out how to put a new elevator in. It was sort of threading the needle. The front of the building was at a different elevation in the back. We needed to get the elevator from the basement to the, to the third floor to the balcony space. We needed to load stuff in. We needed to get people around. And so we really had to be uh, creative in how we threaded the needle and, and put this elevator in the building. A lot of new structure, a lot of new steel you see throughout. None of that's seen now. Now you sort of walk through and the beauty of preservation is that now you can walk through it and. You didn't even realize that any of this new stuff is there. It's all been, it's all been uh, buried and it all sort of harmoniously flows together. Uh, this is, I believe either second or third floor in the back of the building. Front of the building is public assembly space. The back is private office, recording studio, classroom space. 
Uh, we tried to keep as much of the original fabric framing as we could, uh, but we sort of reconfigured uh, some of the interstitial and, and interior spaces for new use. Always need to have a, a dramatic danger photo in a presentation, and this was uh, Washington Hall during construction. Reopening, I mean, some, you know, this photo for me at least, or photos really represent the, the bringing back the hall for the community. It's really always nice for me to, you know, go over there, not so much in the past year and a half, but before, before COVID, going over there and just sort of sitting in a seat off to the side, hiding in the corner or something. Um, it's, it's really fun just to sit and watch people use the building and enjoy the building and, 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 and whether they understand the history behind the building or not, it's their building. You know, they do take a pride of ownership that is very meaningful. Uh, I know it was meaningful for Kathleen when, when she spent a lot of time there. And it was certainly meaningful for me to this day going over and seeing the building used in really creative ways by community members. Uh, I think I'll end on this. It really does take a team of people, no matter no matter all, what tools you're talking about, whether it's TDRs or working in an affordable housing space or trying to do stuff like a Washington Hall, it really does take a team of just people that care. And I, I get emotional about stuff uh, on a pretty regular basis. And the one thing that does make me emotional is when I work with people that, that give a damn, that, that, that work with purpose and work with a mission uh, to achieve something greater than themselves. And, and Washington Hall for, for Historic Seattle was that project. And we're fortunate and privileged to be able to look at new projects now. We probably have two or three that we're looking at uh, actively purchasing right now. And, and we're always looking for the next Washington Hall, creating, creating affordable space for a community that really underscores what we do as an organization to save meaningful places uh, for you know, fostering lively communities. So with that, Zoe, do we want to take questions now if I need to jump? Or I'm certainly happy I can stay around, looks like for another half hour. So I think we're good on time. I think, I think I maybe. Oh, go ahead, Kathleen. I was just going to say I'd like to um, get over to Nick and do some compare and contrast with real estate strategies because Forterra's done a lot of great work with partnerships also, but I think utilizing different kinds of tools than the development authority has. Um, but so um, I have some the same, but yeah, there. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like we have um, any questions at the moment. So I think that we're ready to transition. Uh, I just wanted to make a mention uh, since you're uh, headed off that um, the only thing that I, or one of the things that I thought of with um, Washington Hall, I believe it's located in the um, central district of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And there is a great um, exhibit that Mohai did a couple years back um, and they have a, it's part of their collections of Al Smith, who was a photographer um, and photo uh, photographed a lot of the um, black and uh, Asian experience, the jazz scene um, in the central district in the 1920s. And I was looking at some of those photos um, of Washington Hall and I wonder if he happened to go there and take some photos because it looked like a, you know, a bounce in place um, for that time period uh, and probably a, a, a meeting place where a lot of jazz uh, people came and hung out, but a, a nice connection to other Seattle history. So I'm yeah, interested sure. in that building, very cool. Other than that, um, Kai, thank you so much for, uh, for everything on that. Um, stick around if you have time to yeah, see absolutely. what Nick has to say, but um, yeah, either, either way, thank you. Um, and I'm sure that we'll have a lot of questions at the end. And Nick, do you wanna um, bring us along with, yeah, um, what you have? Sure, I'll, uh, I have a, I have a um, uh, uh, presentation as well. I'll, I'll try to blow through relatively quick. There are a lot of similarities and some differences um, and some different focus uh, in certain areas. So I'll see what I can do here. And, About one second, I'm gonna share it on a different screen because it's not working the way I want it to that way. 
Okay. There we go. That's what I was looking for. All right. So um, real quick, I'll just go through, you know, Forterra itself. You know, we're a uh, Washington-based nonprofit. Uh, we enhance, support, and steward the region's most precious resource, its communities, and its ecosystems. Uh, Forterra conserves and stewards land, develops innovative policies, and supports sustainable and rural and urban development. Um, it's pretty flowery. You know, people wonder why a land trust, which typically is conserving, you know, forest, fish, and farm, um, is delving into uh, uh, affordable slash attainable housing, urban development, um, and, and potentially in certain cases, historic preservation. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a recognition now and uh, in a, in a, in a kind of a change that we went through um, that, you know, we can't effectively grow in a region like the South Sound or, or, or Western Washington um, and keep conservation and, and wild places and, and ecosystems healthy without also, you know, recognizing that people live in cities and towns and those have to be robust and healthy and, and places of, of important too. So uh, we made a decision to, you know, maybe uh, delve into the urban world and see if there's a way that we could change the defini definition of conservation, essentially, um, to include people in the, place, the places where they live, not just where they want to go hike, right? Um, so that's Forterra in a nutshell. Um, uh, there's probably more to it, but you know we'll leave it at that at the moment. I'm going to talk about a couple of things overview uh, in an overview. One is community preservation, and one is attainable housing, and uh, so we'll kind of dig into that real quick. So, community preservation. Um, you know, uh, community preservation basically, for, from our point of view, is a recognition of the cultural and historic meaning that communities assigned to land and buildings and the places, you know, where we work, where Forterra works and where people live. Um, this dynamic offer represents family, um, purpose, pride, you know, it gives voice to the people living uh, in the places that they love. Uh, historic preservation is a, is a really important component uh, of that holistic work, right? It offers a strong anchor from which uh, we can pursue community-driven design, uh, ensuring the communities uh, and where we work have a say in what and how you know, we do what we do. Um, often, you know, I have a community planning background, often, you know, the old school version of, you know, asking a community what it, what it would like from, you know, it, from its buildings and its spaces that it congregates is design one or two go away after you make a decision, right? Um, and if there's not really a sense of ownership for a community that wants to come in and actually maybe make a decision on what actually goes there. Maybe they don't want housing. Maybe they don't, you know, there's a really strong history of, and, and, and Kai alluded to this, of, of, you know, what white men feel is best for a community. And we're trying to get away from that and understand that there are places that mean something to people and that we should take them at their word and learn about what that history, in, uh, uh, you know, entails and figure out how to produce what we need to produce for growth, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in an optic, you know, in a view that, you know, we don't always have the, the best answers. And sometimes we need to be able to preserve what a community feels is important. Right. Um, and so within this effort, you know, we've mobilized resources uh, and, and, and our skills uh, to do urban work and with community inspired development. Right. And so whether that's transforming, you know, underused areas into hub for housing, business, and transportation at Everett Station, which is a project we're working on, or a mixed use and attainable housing development that we're working on currently in Tacoma's Hilltop, uh, or Wadajir residences in Souk and Tukwila for the Somali community, um, or the reclamation of the Nettie Asbury home in the Hilltop, which I'll talk more about later. Um, you know, we've, we have a view that historic preservation is a key component, but it's really about community preservation um, that, that, you know, that really brings this home for us. And in that vein, you know, we, we were looking at uh, attainable housing as a, you know, as both a way to preserve community, um, but also to tackle problems that we have, <laughs> right? Um, so our goal, you know, for attainable housing is basically uh, ownership and rental housing that's priced at 60% of AMI. For example, in 2020 numbers in Pierce County, 60% of AMI is a family making about $48,000 a year. That means their housing costs should be no more than about $1,200 a month. Uh, that's, 
you know, anybody who owns or rents a home in Tacoma or Seattle knows that that's not typically what you're, you know, uh, what, what market's going to offer you, right? So how do we do that, right? So we, 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 we go for kind of a classic land trust model of land banking, where we partner with communities to acquire property. Uh, we develop a social impact investing model where investors recognize their investment is not about a return, but about a social and good community benefits as a return in lieu of strict fiscal returns. Uh, we use innovative construction methods like modular construction with mass timber uh, for, for, sustainable, for sustainable affordability at reduced costs. Um, and then we have a cooperative ownership model, right, that basically brings ownership equity to uh, uh, to, a, to a community uh, that is attainable now and will stay attainable in the future because it's based on a land, like on a land bank trust model. Um, and, you know, from a pre-development advisory council and community input to post-closing governance, you know, we've committed to community partnerships and equitable engagement every step of the way, right, in, in the development and the design process. Um, and so that's kind of the spirit of the community-driven design for our attainable housing that we've, we've started to, uh, to, to pursue. And how do we do this, right? So how, what, are, what are the funding and the incentives that allow us to kind of get to where we're at, right? Uh, so the first is land banking and buy and holds. And, and land banking is, is basically working with a community or collective to purchase land in anticipation of stabilizing costs for the benefit of the said community or collective in pursuit of a beneficial outcome. Often this is housing, but it's not, um, not limited to housing in any shape or form. Land trust have used this for a very long time, uh, use this as a tool to protect land and facilitate those outcomes for partners who may be unable to pursue an acquisition on their own at that immediate time. Um, and land making in this vein is also referred to as a buy and hold, right? This can happen with conservation land, this can happen with housing, with community space in an urban area, whatever. Uh, you know, we're able to use land banking as a tool to prevent either an unwanted sale, demolition of a building, uh, or, or unwanted future use of a property uh, with adequate funding and plan repayment from interested stakeholders and partners. So we can do that through grants, through loans, uh, through the impact investment funds, and through philanthropy. Another thing that we use, obviously, here is grants and appropriations. Um, uh, you know, historically grants uh, are, are, are used, whether they're state, private, or federal, uh, to do a lot of work uh, nonprofits facilitate or public entities like PDAs facilitate. Um, you know, so, you know, it's pretty typical. And historical preser in historic preservation, this means a couple of things, right? You can use competitive grant funding allocated specifically for what we think of as historic preservation, uh, funding like the Heritage Capital Program at the state level or national programs like here, uh, the Historic Preservation Fund administered by the National Park Service. But we can also use competitive grant funding to pursue specific actions on a historic preservation project, but it's not necessarily tied to historic preservation uh, generally. Um, so there's ways you can leverage funding to do this kinds of work. Um, and in that vein, you can, you know, you can leverage funds garnered for a specific community preservation purpose um, through an appropriation like Governor Inslee's social justice appropriation budget, which is where we got money for uh, the Asbury acquisition, which is specified to a project that may or may not need or include historic preservation, but is, is, is geared at community preservation generally. Um, so if the pursuit of community preservation becomes a focus of historic preservation, then I think the opportunities for funding specific brick and mortar projects may increase depending on how you look at it or how those grants or appropriations are designed. Transfer and development rights is an interesting thing. This is something you wouldn't typically think of when we're um, thinking about historic preservation, but uh, maybe later we can get to the opportunities here, but very briefly, uh, transfer of development rights works. Um, you know, we have a bundle of sticks. It, 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 this is kind of a, how you explain how real estate works, right? When you own a piece of property, typically you own, you know, mining rights, air rights in some cases, right? Development rights. Can you tear this thing down and build more density? Um, uh, you know, rights to use water, water rights. There's a number of rights associated with property, right? So, when you're looking at a farm or a forest and, and, and you're trying to prevent development um, from sprawling out of our urban areas into suburban areas and exurban areas and taking up farms and forests and natural areas that we want to preserve, there are development rights associated with those properties based on the kind of zoning that those properties are under. So essentially what you do is you buy these development rights um, that brings the price of the property down because those development rights are going into uh, a city, you know, a, a bucket that the city can then use to um, uh, incentivize higher density and growth within urban areas where we want growth to happen versus um, out in the exurban and suburban areas where we want to limit that so we can have, you know, healthy fish and healthy streams and forests and things like that. So that's a very crash course on 
transfer of development rights. It's basically providing money for conservation by using targeted zoning in areas that we want to build. So from Tacoma in particular, um, right, this is an interesting, interesting thing in, in, in trying to figure out how we use TDR to promote affordable housing and potentially historic uh, uh, preservation. So, in, you know, in this scenario one, the city of Tacoma's development regulations current off, currently offer a menu of options for developers to, pick, to gain bonus height and density, which increases rentals and things like that in, in the city. The list may contain choices that aren't priced equally, um, with a subjective argument that the public benefit of the choices are also not weighted equally, right? So, for example, all things being equal, the developer will probably pick an inexpensive benefit to gain a bonus building development height, you know, like adding building design elements or doing something they were already planning on doing, like residential use, which is an incentive, rather than choosing something like TDR or affordable housing, which has, in our opinion, a higher public benefit, um, you know, which, so we argue we're, we're, we're offering a better public benefit through those incentives than the other ones, but they're not weighted in a way that incentivizes developers to use them more, right? So in the second scenario, you see, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity potentially to change this and, and, and have the city ensure that all new construction using incentives development program will include both affordable housing and TDR in some proportion. And then, you know, the a council would establish and this would result in more consistent delivery of high value public benefits with redevelopment opportunities. The more choices you offer, the less predictability there is in terms of what actually gets built, right? So with fewer choices, you're more likely to get the kind of development you want or community wants by more effectively connecting demand for growth with affordable housing and locating growth in your jobs, schools, businesses, and infrastructure. It's also important to bear in mind that the incentive zoning is illustrating the example is only one of many approaches, right? This is just kind of like a off the cuff, like this is something you could do um, to achieving these public benefits. To effectively deliver a wide range of benefits, the city needs a comprehensive diversified strategy. Um, so there's, how, how do we, how do we put, you know, historic preservation in this context or community preservation in this context, right? So you have scenario three, potentially, and for those of you, I, I know I'm, you know, this is the Luzon building. I know this is a very sore subject in Tacoma, but I wanted to make a point that, um, you know, buildings are very important. And if, with the right incentives, you may be able to avoid tearing amazing buildings like the Luzon building down um, for no good reason. <laughs> uh, so this third scenario here is a builder uses the city's new incentive zoning program to redevelop a historically significant building by purchasing TDR credits, ensuring a minimum amount of affordable housing. And that minimum can be a very high minimum if we decide that rather than pursuing a dem demolition permit or building elsewhere, and is offered a bonus benefit for combining those incentives in such a way that makes the development worth doing. So this is actually what Kai was talking about, right? Which is like, you don't have to have historic preservation or affordable housing. You can figure out a way to incentivize, you know, building affordable housing or attainable housing within, right? Um, a, a historic preservation and you may, you can incentivize that right now. Some people may say, well, there's not enough room in a, in a historic building. There's not, there's saving a historic building does not preclude that you can't, um, you know, build adjacent to it or over a certain floor or something like that so that you're still, you know, preserving the integrity of the structure that you're trying to preserve. But there's ways that you can also remodel, you know, and add to and, and come up with a way that you can actually increase that density where it may not be offered in a smaller building. But that's, we don't need to go into that argument at the moment. So the idea basically is to incentivize you know, historic preservation rehab development by granting higher densities through the use of TDR and affordable housing incentives. Um, you know, that could effectively be a really good combination of tools, right? Um, I feel like I'm going a little long and I, I don't want to blow through too much. Um, I, 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 I want to talk about LCLIP, but I think it's a little bit too in the weeds right now. So I'm going to go straight. I can take questions later and we can also share the presentation. Um, but I want to talk about some examples of what we're doing here in Tacoma. Um, you know, so we have one TDR example that, that was recently done here in Tacoma. Um, the farmland uh, from the Rice Farm here is owned by PCC Farmland Trust at the moment. It's currently being leased to Four Elements Farm. Uh, prior to leasing the farm, the farmers were finding a difficult time locating land in the county to farm on, especially with water rights still intact. So transferring the development rights from the property allowed for the farmers to utilize land they would not have previously been able to afford. Uh, the family farm is currently growing a variety of 50 crops and employing five people rather than being a suburban 
subdivision, right? Uh, the purchase of the four TDR credits uh, for $38,000 allowed 21 additional units to be added to the stadium apartments projects, which recently completed a couple years ago. So this adds two stories to the mixed use complex that was already going in being located in the stadium district. The purchase of the four TDR credits uh, increased the cost of the building by about 17 cents per square foot uh, or about $220 per unit. So it's a good deal. Although this was the first TDR attraction in Pierce County, the developers stated they had no hesitation using the program. The parcel is located on a compact lot. Increasing the amount of airspace utilized made the project financially feasible, right? So the TDR allowed for a bonus height increase, the lowest cost of the bottom line. The Crino and Associates who did, the, who did the, the development also see the use of TDR as an opportunity to contribute uh, to conserving land in the county, which has a lasting impact and, and creates a good story. So we know that this works. We know it works in Seattle. Uh, anybody, you know, Seattle's been using TDR very effectively for a very long time. We're trying to pursue and push uh, better and more effective use in Pierce County and Tacoma. Um, some other examples of what we're doing in attainable housing is Hilltop, right? This is a deal that we're designing right now with the community. It was purchased in 2019 using uh, the land bank model that I went over earlier. Um, it's a two-year community engagement effort so far with a local investment council that we uh, that that we off you know that we we invited people to participate in leading the design efforts. Um, it's a community-inspired design through and through. Uh, at pioneering, we're pioneering an attainable housing uh, co-op housing model using cross-laminated timber, which is sourced from rural areas. Uh, the community preservation and recognition uh, of this project, uh, you know, includes things like celebrating Hilltop Artist Commissions, which are currently working in the space um, as an art studio to do uh, to produce art locally, local produce art that will then be in the eventual development. Um, Tacoma Urban Performing Arts Center, Tupac, is located in there and does uh, youth dancing. Um, and, and production uh, for the community. And it, the, the parking lot and, and area houses the Bite of Black business events. So even before this development goes up, we're trying to activate and use this site to preserve community efforts to, to, to have events and, and art and, and basically activating the space, which is an old Rite Aid that's been abandoned for a very long time. The last one I'll go over is, is the gem is my, my most favorite one. Uh, this is the Asbury home, which is a historic home um, in, uh, in Tacoma's Hilltop. It's 130 years old, predates Washington State Hood. Um, it's a historic and cultural landmark, both locally and nationally. We expect it to be national. Uh, the property symbolizes the proud and important history of the black community in Tacoma's Hilltop, uh, which is older than the home itself. It's a 150 year old community. Uh, it was the home of Dr. Nettie Asbury and her husband, Henry Asbury, bought in 1903. It was one of many real estate holdings owned by them. Uh, they're kind of a black power couple in the early 20th century. And Nettie Asbury is a national gem, right? She, she's known for her music room where she taught local youth uh, and remembered for the large backdoor gatherings in, in, in the community. Um, she uh, is... Um, She's believed to be the first uh, African-American woman in this country to receive a PhD, um, has studied overseas, studied music overseas. She's a civil rights leader uh, in, in, in Tacoma. It's a very important um, recognition of the importance of, of the Hilltop community and, and the power and the, the influence that it had over our history in Tacoma. And so we're working to acquire this property um, on behalf of and with the Colored Women's Club in Tacoma. Uh, which is actually Nettie as was a was an organization founded locally by Nettie Asbury, um, and and so that we can uh, ensure that that piece of land and that property, which is ultimately developable, um, that it stays uh, as a historic piece and a, and a reminder and an active space for the for the uh, Black community in, in Tacoma's Hilltop, whether it's as a museum or a uh, event space or just, a, you know, um, something else, you know, we don't know. That's going to be a, uh, a process that we work through with the CWC in the, uh, into the future that's going to be decided by the community. But we had the expertise to come in and help make sure that it was protected and that it was not ever going to be torn down or developed. So um, we are, are super happy to be working on this project and, and honestly, right in the middle of it right now. So uh, I can't say too much more, but it is it is moving and it has been a, a really, really fantastic opportunity. I have two more slides. Um, I kind of want to bring things home and connect things home here. So the Force to Home initiative is kind of 
um, how this attainable housing thing wraps up for communities, right? Uh, we're talking about delivering affordable housing from local craftsmen and local timber. It's a triple bottom line of social equity, responsible forest management and economic development made possible by modular development of cross laminated timber. Uh, this, you know, creates jobs for rural timber communities, modernizes building methods and alleviates financial burdens for home buyers. And the whole point is, is that we're able to come in with a land bank model, preserve a community asset, whether it's a piece of land or a building, and then utilize this forest to home model to either um, add to or to build new if necessary, depending on, because sometimes it's not the building, it's the land, right? So with the Rite Aid building on Hilltop, the community is not enamored with the Rite Aid building. That's not the issue. The issue is that it is a key piece of land that's in the, uh, you know, the historically black um, uh, commercial business district on Martin Luther King Jr. Way down, you know, in, on Hilltop. And that has been a blight on that community for a very long time because Rite Aid took off, right? So it's not always about a building. It's about a piece of land. And if we can build something with the community on that land, Right, we see that as a really strong uh, argument to, to ensure that community preservation is taken seriously. Um, the last piece of connection, I have a couple of questions here that are just kind of like thought questions uh, for people to think about in this, you know, in the context of, 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 the, of the stuff we've talked about here. You know, how do we ensure sustainable redevelopment in our cities using innovative incentives and policy to prevent sprawl, conserve critical lands and grow? while retaining our cultural centers and affordability, right? Because like Kai was talking about, often we're thinking that that's not doable, that we we actually, you know, we can't actually conserve everything that we wanna conserve, prevent sprawl, but also retain our culture and our historic buildings in our cities while we grow, because either we grow out or we grow up, but we, we think we can do that together, right? And secondly, if we think about that first question, how do we recognize and foster community and historic preservation uh, as a component of our city's futures while developing into that growth that we know it's going to happen. So how do we actually focus on community and historic preservation in that mode, right? Um, we're not going to answer that today, but <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everybody had kind of some, some, uh, some, some things to think about as they, as they left this conversation. So uh, that is all I have. I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, oh, I was actually going to say, if you wanted to leave that up, we could. I can also leave that questions. up if you'd like. It's, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, before, I wanted to quickly jump in because Kai, I know that you are um, getting ready to leave, but this is a question that came up in the Q&A, which is, um, how do you determine which buildings to take on as projects and properties? And this is uh, for both of you, but Kai, if you wanted to answer before you head off. We, we've struggled with that for 50, almost 50 years. I mean, mm. um, we, we've, had, we've had notions of creating some sort of project selection criteria, a filter, you know, a, a, you, know you throw everything in the, in the top of the funnel and you shake it around and you see what comes out the bottom. Some sort of um, matrix, yeah. Yeah, you know, we we've been playing with that. We're we're working toward that. But fundamentally, you know, I think um, you know it when you see it. You know, it, it uh, we approach things, and I, maybe it's just me. I approach things with head and heart, right? It's gotta it's gotta it's gotta mean something sort of emotionally and in your heart. It's got there's gotta be a connection there that you can actually feel, and then you gotta justify it. Then you have to do a pro forma. And then you have to do a sources and uses. And then you've got to bring in experts that actually know if the building's in good shape or not, or you bring in zoning experts, you bring it, you start using your head to justify <laughs> what your heart feels. That for me is my project selection criteria. Um, for better or worse, you know, that's that's how we tend to do it. Um, but we have been working on a on a criteria of some sort that takes into consideration just you know a, evaluation of risk, you know. Cost to capital, uh, use, uh, location, zoning, all the typical real estate, you know, sort of parameters that you'd look at. Um, but for us, there's really no hard and fast answer. I know so, Nick is different. Nick, Nick has his acting. Yeah, he's got, yeah he's sure. got it all. Like, <laughs> yeah, at the risk of saying ditto. Um, <laughs> it's hard, right? Um, often there's there's, a, I mean, there's too many factors, really, you have to, you have to weigh and balance so many different things. Uh, at the outset, I'll say that often it's a community that brings us, whether it's a community or a landowner, specifically, 
brings us an opportunity. It's very rare that we're actively or proactively sourcing things. I would love to be able to do so, but there's so much, um, one, there's so much need and so much uh, interest that we often are, are find ourselves turning people away more than, more than not because um, there's so much, uh, there, like I said, there's so much interest in kind of what we do and, and, and how we manage that. When you get to a place that you are, that you, 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 your heart says, okay, this is it. And for, for Asbury, that's what it was for me, right? I mean, I talked to Cynthia Tucker um, and, and Marshall McClintock uh, and, uh, you know, I thought that this is it. I'm not letting this one go, right? So some of those hit you and you, and you got it. You have to justify it. You know, you don't give yourself a choice. Um, and I did, <laughs> I did justify it and I figured it out. And most of that was what Kai said, right? You, you find the funding, you figure out how you're going to do it. You negotiate with the landowner, you're looking at grants, you're looking at appropriations, you're trying to figure out, you know, your timelines. Um, but other times it's a little bit more logical. And, and a lot of that was, is less about that what, when, when somebody's thinking about a place that they live and walk past every day, and it's more about you're looking at, a, you know, that matrix that I mentioned, right? You have kind of like, well, we work a lot in the Chehalis Basin, right? I, I work in the Chehalis Basin a ton on conservation property. You know, the state comes to us and says, we have, uh, you know, we have this effort. We're doing 300 to 500 miles of restoration in the Chehalis Basin. Uh, we want an option for landowners who participate in the restoration to have compensation through either an easement or, an act, or, or fee acquisition. In that case, you have kind of set parameters that are easy to get to. And if you don't get a landowner on board, it's not like a heartbreaking thing because you were going to them. But that doesn't happen very often. A, a lot of times it's people coming to us and we have to weigh the good with the bad and the cost benefit. Like, is this going to, you know, is there, who's going to pay for the stewardship of this property? It's stewardship's always always, always the linchpin, right? Like we, I could get all kinds of stuff pushed forward with the landowner. I could get the grant funding. I could, uh, and then if we can't find the 50 K it takes to manage that property in perpetuity to put in our endowment, it's a really hard sell because a, a lot of what you risk when you go forward with your heart and you do really good projects, but then you have a portfolio of land that you cannot take care of that actually pisses people off a hell of a lot more than not doing it in the first place, right? Um, I, I, to anybody who's my, my state agency friends on this call, I, am, I apologize, but that is the big dig against state agencies owning land is when you own too much and you're at the whim of budgets that do this based on who's in office, you know, often your down budgets means you're not taking care of your properties and then you have thousands and thousands of acres of wildfires for years and years and years, right? Now that isn't necessarily a direct correlation to like an urban stewardship, but it's this the idea is similar, you know? The, so, uh, you know, so like I said, I, I'm just rambling now, basically ditto is what I said. <laughs> I think those are both wonderful answers and um, important. It was an important question, uh, which I appreciate being asked. I, I, at the end of the day, it's really about partnerships out there, how you can establish those relationships in the community, because we all know that people who live in a place specifically have very deep ties to it. And they, when they come to us with an issue or a problem or a concern, that's, that's a really great place to start. Going off of um, that a little bit, uh, and in the question of partnerships, especially in relation to community partnerships, one of the questions, um, or one of the things that I noticed that both of you uh, mentioned in your talk was, um, is sort of that relation of um, equity in project development and how you're trying to create, you're trying to listen to people and you know, have it from a perspective of what the community actively needs and is saying that they want. How, um, what kind of strategies do you guys use to uh, do that connection with the community and development of your projects? So that's, you know, it, it's funny because you think of a, a model um, of public meetings or, um, you know, uh, community-led meetings. And, and typically you're still limited in some, sh sh you know, shape or fashion to those, that style of, 
of, of, of broad outreach after you've, you've solidified maybe kind of a core group of people who are interested who maybe brought you a project. So whether it's organizational organization uh, or a city, um, you know, typically where you fall short is, is, is the limitations of um, being able to truly broaden and figure out what people want because often the, you know, a minority will be very loud and, and, and a majority will be very, very quiet. Um, but not only that, we also, when it comes to urban development uh, specifically, we also have kind of a suite of things that we do. And we kind of follow that path unintentionally in a lot of ways, right? Um, what, you know, when people say, well, you know what I really want? I really want a soccer field on top of a roof. People are like, well, that's crazy. But like at the end of the day, is it really that crazy? And the thing is, we just don't, it's not in our lexicon, right? So, and I don't know why that just came up for me. I'm a soccer player, I guess why, but 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 I think what it takes is 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 trust and listening, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to trust that people that have been living for generations in an area know what they need, right? Now, sometimes you are left with decisions. Is this going to be housing? Yes, we know it's going to be housing. Okay, if that's the case, how can we provide the most maximum flexibility for other amenities? open space, how the housing is designed, right? If, if you're limited to a structure, you know it's gonna be this. Well, then how can we make sure that that structure is, it, that, that it, you know, that if it's gonna be housing, but that the housing is solely developed in, 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 in view of, of the public and the people are gonna be living there. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy because you have to make a conscious effort to do so. Um, and it has to be, it's kind of like turning, a, like my old boss would say, it's a turning a battleship, right? You just. Eventually it turns, but it takes a long time. <laughs> oh. I think for historic Seattle, um, it's really intentional and not performative when we engage people. Um, things like a, a, a thoughtful land acknowledgement at the beginning of our education programs and our meetings. We are a place-based history organization. And for us not to acknowledge that we're on other people's land, Native American tribal land, is crazy. We, should, we, we do that. Um, having people, um, having diversity on our council and our foundation board. You know, we, we've made an intentional effort to, uh, to bring people from different backgrounds on, on our board and council. Um, our advocacy work is very intentional uh, with, with specific outreach to traditionally disenfranchised communities in Seattle. Um, our education programming has really turned you know, from stories of dead old white guys with the oldest house on the hill, right? I mean, to put it bluntly, to telling the full Seattle story. In all, in all its forms and fashions and shapes and colors and sizes. So for us, you know, it really is a, uh, an honest and intentional effort to engage people and to earn respect uh, rather than just doing performative things that make me feel better. I think that's really important, what Kai said. Um, and I think it's also important just to, to back that up and to acknowledge that the history of and for for our land trust specifically, this, I'm not I'm not putting historic Seattle in this purview necessarily, but the history of land conservation of land trusts is a history of white supremacy, point blank. Period. We're talking about land accumulation and land recreation and use for certain people, and that benefit and that that view that it is for us, and that does not make any of us white supremacists, right? But, but it is, when we talk about how we engage the public and how we engage the community, and it's kind of like a pathway that's been set for a long time and it's hard to get off it, it's the same exact thing with land trust. It's just, it, it's, a, it's a history that you have to reconcile and we have to change and, and acknowledge and understand. But it's, it's one of those things where you, you know, for a long time, it just was what it was because it was that before. And there was no other reason for it to be like that other than it was the, the, the year before. And so we're struggling with that right now. Not, I shouldn't say struggling. We are, we are, are dealing with it. We're reconciling with it. And we're, we're really trying to do things different and better. And that includes things like the land acknowledgement and diversifying our staff and our board, um, but also includes 
you know, that's another one of the reasons why we, we decided that it was not worth just to focus on forests and, and, and outlying areas. You know, we need to focus where people live and we need to focus where um, communities who typically have not had opportunities, we need to focus on using our power and our strength to provide those opportunities and to make sure that they're adequately and equitably distributed. Excellent. I think that is really well put, all of you guys. Kai, you're headed Thank out. you for the time. I appreciate it. If uh, anyone on this call participating here or, or out in the, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always available to talk, talk preservation, talk Seattle, talk Tacoma anytime. So I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Kai. You. Thanks, Kai. Yeah. Well, perfect. Um, Along with that, I think um, I just wanted to also um, iterate going off the question that we just had that um, absolutely, I think one of the largest things of dealing um, of working in fields that relate to um, history or um, or things even uh, like uh, real estate, which can connect to redlining and histories of um, um, non-inclusion in, um, in certain spaces that all of these um, larger systematic uh, and histories that uh, are extremely complicated can be dealt with and, um, and addressed uh, in our current actions. And I uh, can absolutely see how that is coming through in your guys' work. So very cool to see the strategies that you guys use. Um, on that, I don't think that we have any questions from Facebook? I'm checking real quick. Um, but uh, Kathleen, did you have any uh, thoughts or questions that you noticed from this uh, presentation that you wanted to share before? We well, I just I wanted to mention that I think um, I, I think the Asbury House is having an event on September 22nd. I gotta get that phone off. You may be right. I it recently um, got back from PTO and I did get an email from Cynthia, but I've not uh, dug into it yet. She wants me to be a part of an event, she says. So my guess is that is correct. <laughs> okay, well, excellent. We will, um, I will link a bunch of um, uh, uh, links to the um, Asbury website and uh, Forterra as well as Historic Seattle and Historic Tacoma, in case anyone wants to um, connect with you guys, ask any further questions, check out your guys' work. Um, I think that, oh, actually, we might have another question in the q and I think Jay just corrected the date. Perfect, yes. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, um, I Thank think you. that that covers anything. Any, anything else you'd like to share? I, I'm, I'm great. I, I really appreciate you having me on and being able to talk about this um, and, and kind of give a both an update and also a, a kind of a strong view on how um, on how we think about these things. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll echo Kai, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody or uh, answer any questions, feel free to email or, or call or, you know, if, if somebody wants the, the presentation, I can I can offer that as well. Uh, you have my, my stuff. So I, I'm more than welcome. Okay, I guess that the uh, Asbury House event is on the 25th of September and there'll be more coming out about that. But basically I'm just so interested in the work that both Forterra and Historic Seattle are doing. I think it's uh, it's creative, it's uh, energetic, it's problem solving, and it's a way to bring people together to create the kind of community that they want and that we want. Um, so it's I'm just, inspiring. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna put that slogan right on our website. That was really that was really well done, Kathleen. <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I was drawn to Forterra, and um, you know, and honestly, the, I you know what I do on a daily basis is 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 just exactly what I want to be doing. Um, it's it's really uh, I, I stress. I like to say it's really, really great work. I don't like to say it's important because that's subjective to a lot of different people, but uh, for me, it's great and it's rewarding and um, building trust and, and, and offering outcomes that a community can look at and be proud of are, are really important to me. So, um, especially in the town that I live in, right? I get to work in Tacoma uh, often on stuff and it's just, it's a, it's a great feeling. So I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. 
Thank you for the work that you are doing. And thanks, uh, Zoe, for facilitating this with the city. And thanks to the Tacoma Historical Society and Historic Tacoma for sponsoring it. I'm glad it's being recorded. I think it's going to be really useful to go back and and uh, look at some of the tools that were laid out today. So great. Thank you. Perfect. Right. That was the perfect, uh, perfect ending. So on that, we're just going to say uh, adios to everyone and thank you for attending. Thank okay. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.